Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. If you've been paying attention to advances in technology, science, or just news in the world, it's hard not to be impressed with recent progress in artificial intelligence, mostly driven by neural networks and deep learning, machine learning kinds of techniques. We've really been able to do things with AI that when I was your age, we just couldn't do. For one thing, Artificial intelligence programs are easily able to kick the butts of human beings when it comes to games like Go and chess, which was considered very far away not too long ago. Uh, Another example is GPT-3, which you may have heard of, which is one of these language processing things where you can ask it a question or you can give it a prompt in some sense, and it will respond or will continue on in the vein of the words that you gave it on the basis of the fact that it has read a lot of things and it sort of looks for correlations between them. And finally, and maybe, you know, most importantly for our everyday lives, AI is everywhere around us in vision recognition, you know, recognizing the images that are in front of us, maybe even self-driving cars or something like that someday, but certainly recommendations, what music to listen to, what movies to watch, etc. AI is at work. So on the one hand, it's very impressive. On the other hand, none of these are going to be confused for a human being. None of these versions of AI are going to pass the Turing test in some very advanced way. You can sort of jigger up versions of the Turing test that are passable by modern AI, but it's not a full-blown general intelligence, right? AGI, artificial general intelligence, the kind of AI that would really fool you into thinking it might as well be human. So today's guest, Gary Marcus, thinks that he knows why we're not able to do that. More importantly, he thinks that we're moving in the wrong direction or focusing on the wrong things to make progress in this particular direction. The idea is that there are certain kinds of things that neural networks, deep learning is good at looking for correlations in gigantic data sets. There's other things that it's not good at. It's not good at understanding in some vague sense that we would like to define. It's not good at common sense, at understanding how the world works at a basic level so that in individual circumstances, we can apply our knowledge in a kind of reliable way. That's why self-driving cars turn out to be harder than we thought they would be. The world out there is a messy place, and you need a picture of the fundamental way the world works, not just a set of correlations in your computer, or at least that's what Gary would say. And he even has advice for how we can make progress in the right direction because there's been a shift in how artificial intelligence research has been done. In the early days, it was symbolic. You would try to define symbols, variables in your AI program that represented different things and then look for relationships or try to define relationships between the different variables. Whereas it's almost more mindless today. The deep learning algorithms just take in a whole bunch of data and then spit out correlations between them. As Gary points out, uh, the best deep learning algorithms actually are hybrids. They actually make use of the symbolic approach as well, but he still thinks we should be going a lot further in that direction. We really need that kind of understanding-based approach to make artificial intelligence of the kind you would recognize as human-like in some sense. And that might not just be something we want to do because it would be cool. It might be important technologically going forward. So we're going to dig into that. It's a lot of fun. Gary's a very opinionated guy. He actually started out in neuroscience and psychology before moving into AI. So he really cares about how real human beings think. He wants to make computers think better than they do today. So let's go. Gary Marcus, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Glad to be here. So we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. Let me give a my impression of the history very, very briefly so you can tell me whether I'm correct or not. Like there was, there were go-go days of artificial intelligence, I mean, maybe in the 60s and 70s, where we were first getting computers that were up to the task of even thinking about it. And people thought very soon we'd be talking to them and having deep philosophical conversations. Uh, and then that didn't pan out. It turned out to be harder than we thought. These days, there's a bit of a resurgence, right? I mean, AI is kind of everywhere, neural networks, people are thinking about self-driving cars. 
And you're on the side of being a little bit of a gadfly, right? You're saying like, okay, yes, we've had some successes here, but this is not going to be just smooth sailing until we get real human level intelligence. Is that a fair overview? Yeah, I mean, I could pick some uh, details. So I think the first bit of enthusiasm was in the 50s uh, okay. rather than the 60s. And the first winter, the first AI winter, which I think is important, was in the early 70s when there was something called the Light Hill Report, I think 1973, that said, hey, this stuff isn't really going anywhere. We're putting all <laughs> this money into it, but what are we getting for it? Um, and research really slowed down then. And I think that the field lives in permanent worry that that might happen again. Hmm. Um, it maybe should live in even more worry uh, than it does. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's a little edit there. Um, I would <laughs> like to clarify for the record that I love AI. I'm not someone sure. who thinks AI is impossible. Um, I use the word gadfly. I would probably use the word skeptic. And I, to that point of that skepticism, there's both a specific and a general. The, the general thing is one of my favorite graphs I ever saw was the prediction for how far away, let's say, artificial general intelligence might be, although the term is new, but the idea has been around for a long time that, you know, how, how many years until we have AI that's actually, let's say, as smart as people, and we yeah. can talk about whether that's even the right criterion. And you look, and it's basically always people say it's 20 years away. Classic. They always say, you know, <laughs> 20 years from now. So, you know, that itself is a little bit of an object lesson. And then there's a question about what is it that we actually have now? What have we made progress on and what not? And I know as a physicist, you have respect for the data and you have respect for the fact that there's different kinds of data and different kinds of measurements. And there are some measurements on which the kind of I'll call it the orthodox Kurzweilian notion of exponential growth seems bang on. Mm. And one example for that is chess playing. Another mm -hmm. example is Go playing. On these board games, there has really been exponential growth or even super exponential growth. Um, you know, you look at Go now as compared to when I was a kid and computers couldn't play it at all. I could beat a, a Go player now. And there's no way I could beat AlphaGo. Um, so on, on those kinds of things, there's been exponential growth. On some other things, growth has been slower than the popular media would have it. So, um, you know, the, if you had read the popular media over the last few years, you'd probably think that vision was solved, mm. that we now know how to do computer vision. How to recognize The reality things, yeah. is we have actually made progress there, but we have not solved the problem. So I'm looking at you right now um, on a, you know, a Zoom type call and... Um, I guess your audience isn't looking at the image that I am, but I can instantly parse what's going on there right. and not just label the objects, but I can actually uh, answer questions like there are things on the wall and I can make guesses about how they might be mounted there. Um, and I would be surprised if they started floating around the room. Like I have an understanding, not just of the entities, but how they relate to one another. I see like stacks of books and their paper on top of them. And I understand, you know, why the paper is not floating and not falling. So I, ha I have this kind of integrated with physics understanding of the scene and AI does not have that. And that's yeah. part of what perception is. So, you know, every other month there's another study now showing these so-called adversarial attacks and so forth, showing that these vision systems can be fooled. In fact, mostly they rely on texture and things like that. So one of my favorite examples from recently was a, um, what was that? I think a fire truck overturned on a snowy road and the system said with great confidence that it sees a snow plow. And it did that because on a snowy road, you know, if there's a vehicle, it's likely to be um, the snow cloud. And th these systems are very much driven by textures that they see and by kind of probabilities of what things are generally likely. They don't have an overall understanding of the scene. Another recent example was um, a, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something or other, I, th I think it was a, an apple with the word iPad on a piece of paper in front of it. Right. Um, iPod. And so, you know, it thought that that that, that was an iPod because the, the word was written on, on the page. Yeah. And so, you know, perception is not actually solved, but there has been actual progress. So that's the intermediate case. The first case was true exponential progress. Then there's perception where there are pieces of it where there is exponential progress and pieces of it not so much. And then there's natural language understanding and reasoning. Mm. And I would say we have not really made progress at all. You know, GPT-3, which we may want to talk about, gives the illusion of having natural language understanding, but I don't really think that it does. 
Um, and we are nowhere near, for example, an all-purpose general assistant. We're nowhere near to having the kind of language you would want if you had a domestic robot, right? I have a cartoon in my book um, <coughs> where somebody says, put, put everything in the living room away, and the robot ends up cutting up um, with a saw the couch, right? Because it doesn't <laughs> understand what it is that we would yeah. mean by put everything in the living room away. We have no candidate solution for that problem. It's not just that we've made no progress. We don't even know how to make progress on that. Now you're making so, me sad that there's no artificial intelligence podcast editor. That would that would make my life a lot quicker. <laughs> that would be great. And I mean, you know, even there, there's an example of like how AI does actually help in some ways. So now there are tools if you want to put together PowerPoint slides um, for an online talk in this crazy era in which we are living that will automatically transcribe and do a pretty decent job and then go find where the breaks are in the words. So like there are a lot of places maybe that you wouldn't even expect where AI is actually helping now. There are also some where right. it's hurting now. We should talk about those too. But, um, you know, AI is real now and it wasn't before. And that's a, both a blessing and a curse because some of it's reliable and some of it's not. And, you know, there are all kinds of problems with it. But just on that first question, you know, of history and where we are now, what I would say to wrap up a long winded answer is we made a lot of progress on a lot of things. But there are some core problems, which are mostly about understanding the world and what people are talking about where we really haven't made that much progress. And it could be now we really are for the first time 20 years away, um, where all those other times we you know, we weren't. Um, or it could be we're still like 50 years away. Yeah. The, the, the core question of how you use common sense knowledge of the world in order to interpret things. So again, back to the scene in your room, like also there's a place where the, the lighting values are higher. And I can guess that that's outdoors, like making all of those inferences about what I see and what's likely to be going on. We just don't know how to do that yet. And maybe it's good to, we, we're able to get into the details a little bit. The audience likes the details. So let's try to understand why there has been this progress. And as far as I can tell, the overwhelming majority of recent progress in AI has been driven by neural networks and deep learning algorithms. Is that fair? And, and what does that mean? It's true, but with some caveats. So okay. first of all, there are older techniques that everybody takes for granted, but you know are, are real and are already out there. Second of all, there are things like um, AlphaGo that are actually hybrid models that use classical tree search techniques in, enhanced with Monte Carlo techniques um, in order to do what they're doing. So they're not just a straight um, multi-layer perception as a kind of stereotype that people have of neural networks. You have some inputs, they feed into a hidden layer that does some summation and activation function goes to an output. They're not just that. Right. They actually borrow some important ideas about search, for example, and symbols uh, from classical AI. And so they're actually hybrid systems and people don't um, acknowledge that. So there's a second caveat I would give you. Um, the <coughs> third caveat I would give you, um, we can come back to the second, but the, the, the third caveat I would give you is, yeah, most of the progress has been de with deep learning lately, but most of the money has been there, too. And it was really <laughs> sure. interesting to see. Uh, I mean, and I don't just mean like 60% versus 40. I mean, like 99.9% .9 of the investment right now, literally, um, is in deep learning. And um, you know, sim classic symbol manipulation AI is really out of favor. And people like Jeff Hinton say, don't spend any money on it at all. And so it was really interesting. There was this competition presented at the NeurIPS conference, which is the biggest uh, conference these days in the AI field, um, just a month or so ago on a game called NetHack that has various complications in it. And a symbolic system actually won in an upset victory over all this deep learning stuff. And so, you know, if you look back at the history of AI and the history of science more generally, sometimes things get counted out too soon. It is sure. true that deep learning has made a bunch of progress. But the question is, you know, what follows from there? No, I'm not actually trying to make any value judgments. I'm, I just would like to explain to our audience what the yeah. options are. Like, what, what do you mean by deep learning? What is that? And what is that in comparison to symbolic so, manipulation? So deep learning is fundamentally a way of doing statistical analysis on large quantities of data. Or at least that's, you know, it's forte. You can actually use it in a bunch of different ways. But m most of the progress has come from that. And what's impressive about the recent work is it allows us to learn from very large quantities of data. 
the classical AI system really didn't do a lot of learning at all. They were mostly hand coded. Um, Hmm. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. So we don't need to learn how to do navigation. We need to learn some details, but we don't need to learn how to do navigation for the purpose of one of the most useful AI things out there, which is route planning, telling you how to get home from whatever crazy place you wound up in. Right. Right. That's not a deep learning driven system. But there are other systems where if you can glom on to all the data that's out there, you can solve certain problems very effectively. And that's what deep learning has been good for. So an example of that is labeling your photos in, let's say, the Apple Photos app or, or Google Photos or something like that. There, what you really want to do is to get user data, like measured in the billions or trillions of examples, and have a system that can extract from all of that data what is the most likely label for this image, given the other images that are in my database that have been labeled? So that's a kind of typical use of deep learning is very good at. Mm-hmm. And speech recognition is similar. So, you know, I hear this word, lots of people have said it in lots of different ways. And, you know, I hear this particular sound. Is it like that collection of things that I've heard before or this other collection? It turns out deep learning is just far and away the best and in some ways simplest way to solve a whole bunch of problems like that. Sometimes it's only a little bit better than the other solutions and it gets more press maybe than it deserves, but it usually is the best for these problems where we have billions and billions of training examples. It's, it's usually okay, but, the right way to go. But what is it? How does it work? It's statistics, it's correlations, but how does it find these correlations in, in ways that we couldn't do a few decades ago? So, I mean, the basic idea is not actually new. Is something I should clarify first. So, the mathematics around this has actually been around for decades. People had the idea to do it before. Basically, you're just trying to figure out: I have an error. How can I reduce the error that I've made before? Adjusting weights between a bunch of things that we call nodes that are supposed to make make us think of neurons. I mean, we can have a whole separate discussion about whether they have anything really to do with neurons, (laughs) but they're at least loosely inspired um, by neurons. And you're adjusting the weights between them, sort of how loudly they talk to one another. And if one of them talks too loudly to the other one, you find out over time, well, I should make it talk a little bit more softly. And this one should talk more loudly. And you're basically doing that on a mass scale. um, And it turns out to work really well. Um, the The math was rediscovered a bunch of different times. There's actually a debate in the, um, this mailing list called Connectionist right now about that history, and people periodically have these debates. There's no question that it's been around for a long time. What really happened is that um, people developed GPUs for video games mm-hmm. that allow you to do a lot of the relevant mathematics in parallel at the same time. And that allowed people to do this deep learning thing at a scale that they didn't really even dream of 20 years ago. Um, and so that was a major thing. There, there's this paper called the Hardware Lottery. I'm, I'm trying to think of it. I think her name is Sarah Hooker, wrote this really interesting um, piece about how the, and I confess I've only read the summary of it. I haven't read the piece yet. <laughs> um, but the, the, her thesis is basically you can have these accidents of history where a particular architecture or something like that is available at a particular moment and people just run with it. Sure. And there's a little bit of that going on here. Um, and I don't know if she makes this observation or not, but it connects with what she says, um, where it's kind of partly an accident of what we figured out how to parallelize first that has made deep learning as popular as it is. So, you know, it, it was clever to try to use these chips that were built for something else for the purposes of deep learning, and it really changed deep learning. I, I've made a remark earlier about you know unfairly dismissing things too soon. Deep learning was unfairly dismissed too soon. Mm. So um, I have dismissed its ability to do sort of deep cognition, but that's a separate question. Um, its ability to do basic pattern recognition was actually in doubt. So in the early 2000s, Jeff Hinton, who's his big star now, is kind of like he gave a poster at this conference. And nobody came. Yeah. They were like, <laughs> you know, this stuff doesn't really work. Classic you know, story. We understand right. the math. It's kind of cool. It has its own kind of elegance, but you're not really getting it to work. So, like, forget about it. And to his credit, he stuck with it. And once people like him could use it at scale, it turned out that this technique is actually lousy with small amounts of data, but it's brilliant with large amounts of data. And so it was actually like a perfect storm. So one of it was one aspect of it was getting these chips 
which made a you know, huge difference. Another was we didn't have databases with trillions of examples, you know, in, in let's say the year 2000, you know, the internet is the other major technology that has driven deep learning. The internet means that you have large amounts of data. Yeah. And in and, some sense that from your description, it sounds like, I mean, it's artificial intelligence, but it's kind of dumb and kind of straightforward, right? I mean, you have all these per perceptrons, these nodes, and they have weights, and they just float to whatever is the best at fitting the data on the, on the training set without any deep understanding of what has happened, as you were talking about, you know, papers do not float in the air or anything like that. So what's the, how would you characterize the alternative of uh, the symbolic approach, I guess, is what you're calling it? Yeah, well, let me, um, before I do that, let me say that I think that we need elements of the symbolic approach. I think we need elements of the deep learning approach or something like it, but that neither by itself is sufficient. Sure. And so I'm a big fan of what I call hybrid systems that, that bring together um, in ways that we haven't really even figured out yet, the, the best of both worlds. But <clears throat> with that preface, because um, people often in the field like to misrepresent me as that symbolic guy. And I'm more like the guy who said, don't forget about the symbolic stuff. We need it to be part of the answer. Okay. So the symbolic stuff is basically the essence of computer programming or algebra or something like that. I mean, what's really about is having functions where you have variables that you bind to particular instances and calculate the va values out. So simplest example would be an equation in algebra. Y equals X plus two. I tell you what X is, you can figure out what Y is. And there, it doesn't matter which X's you have seen before. You have this thing that is defined universally, um, is the right. way a logician might put it, universally for everything in some domain, right? Um, and, you know, any physicist would grasp that immediately, um, or any programmer or any logician. And that is the essence of what allows programs to work. So we're using a tool called Zencaster, and it's putting the bits together of your image such that I can see you and vice versa. And it's doing this in real time because there are functions that can do that across any image. And then we might do some image processing if we're on Zoom to do segmentation. We could talk about that. But you know, the, the basic thing there is I have a function that says, you know, for any set of bits, I will do this function. And I don't care if this image is one that I saw before. And similarly, if I type something in the chat box, it doesn't matter if I come up with a novel sentence or a familiar sentence, whereas the deep learning stuff is all about similarity to the things that you have seen before. Right. And so it's really a different almost thesis about what cognition should be. And I think the right thesis is actually our brains anyway can do both. We, we can do the logical abstract stuff. And I actually did experiments in all the way back in the late 90s on human infants showing they could do the abstraction even at seven months old. Um, so there's this ability for us to do abstraction, which allows us to be computer programmers or to do logic. Um, and there's also this like heavy statistical analysis that we humans do. We're not quite as good as the machines at it, but we can do a lot of it. So we know that the word inextricably is often found by linked or bound, but you know, never by water. And you know, we know a lot of statistical <laughs> things too. Um, not at the same scale, but we're good at it and we use it. So we use it in parsing sentences, for example. We make predictions about what the other person's going to say. But then again, if the other person surprises us, we can usually figure it out. So like, you know, a lot of comedy is based on saying something that isn't expected right. and having the, the, the listener, you know, figure out that thing. And if you had a system that only kind of makes predictions, like you can think of um, GPT-3, which is the most famous language system right now, as a really amazing version of autocomplete. Mm -hmm. And autocomplete mm -hmm. is, you know, <clears throat> pretty useful. And we autocomplete to other sentences. But we also have to deal with the unexpected. And oh, for yeah. that, symbols are actually <laughs> really good. And, right. and this is why we need to bring both of these traditions together. Well, you had the example in one of your papers um, that I really liked of children learning how to make the past tense in English, where there's a rule, right? You had ED, uh, I, I podcast, I podcasted, but then there's all these irregular ones where it doesn't follow the rule. And so it's kind of like for the regular verbs, it's a symbolic kind of manipulation. And for the exceptions, it's more like a deep learning kind of thing. Exactly. And that's actually what my dissertation in 1993 um, was about exactly that. It was it was about these split systems. And in fact, I wandered off from AI for a long time because I just found it kind of really not very inspiring and came <laughs> back um, around the time of Watson because I was surprised that Watson actually won at Jeopardy. 
I can mm. tell you why I think it won. But um, I was surprised and not often surprised. And, and as a scientist, when I'm surprised, that really like wakes me up. And so I was reawoken to mm -hmm. AI in, in 2012, I guess, or so by Watson. And then at around the same time, deep learning was popular. And I was like, oh, man, I've seen this movie before because <laughs> the the stuff that I was working on for my dissertation, which included those regular and irregular verbs, which Steve Pinker called the fruit fly of um, cognitive psychology or something like that. Um, all that, it's the same issues yeah. went into my thesis looking at how children were doing things as come up again now when we try to figure out, well, what can deep learning do for us and not? And it's like it can do the irregular verbs, but it's not so great with the regulars. Right. So, but it, it's yeah. interesting because, um, I mean, so deep learning is very, very good at some things. Obviously, we've had tremendous ses success playing chess, playing Go. Protein folding is a new success uh, that, that the yeah, alpha... Can we pause there, though? So, so like... Sure. The the um the success in the protein folding and the success in the games actually depend on hybrid systems and the okay. the media coverage of that and and even the internal understanding in the field doesn't I think realize how much the hybrid stuff is important. So for example, if you just took the deep learning part of AlphaGo and did not have all of the search stuff, the Monte Carlo search there, it wouldn't be that good. And similarly, AlphaFold has a whole lot of very careful structured representations around the nature of the three-dimensional geometry that it's trying to solve. And it's not just a simple multi-layer perception. I'll put in arbitrary data, get arbitrary hmm. data out, and I'm good to go. So, you know, oftentimes the field kind of pumps up the deep learning and doesn't really talk about the other piece of it. I'll give you one other example, um, which is... OpenAI had this example of a system, quote, solving the Rubik's Cube with deep learning. But if you actually read the paper, the part of it that I would think of as solving, which is like knowing which face to turn when, was done entirely by a symbolic algorithm. And they didn't mention that. The deep learning was doing the motor control. And it was, you know, it was a nice contribution to motor control. Not as nice as they made it out to be, but it, it, it was, you know, a real thing to be able to get the system to turn in one hand. Um, the, the Rubik's Cube at the right time. But the, the cognitive part of what should I turn in the Rubik's Cube, which is kind of the part that makes it interesting to the average person is they pick it up and they can do the motor control, but they don't know how to do the other part. Um, that was done by a symbolic system. And none of the media accounts talked about that. And you know, the, the, there is a, a mystique associated with deep learning right now, but often it's actually just part of the picture and that does, just gets completely lost. Sure. But what I'm trying to get at is the fact that these successes don't easily generalize. You know, we think about chess and Go as quintessences of intelligent thought, right? But in some sense, they're really, really simple. The rule set is very, very simple. And it's mostly a matter of having enough capacity and computing power to think about it. And, you know, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of cleverness that goes into designing the algorithms. And I take your point that it's a, as a hybrid kind of algorithm. But my impression is that if you change the rules of the game by a little bit, right, you change the rules that you're allowed to do with the stones, with Go, or how the pieces move yeah. in chess, um, the, the algorithm that was the world's champion at the regular rules wouldn't be able to adapt very easily to the new rules, whereas, well, a, human being, start over. whereas a human being could adapt pretty quickly because it has more heuristic understandings of what positions are strong and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much agree with that. It, it, I mean, it could start over and learn a new game. Of and course. I think that the, the things that, that DeepMind have built are, are pretty good at games that where there's a closed world and you can gather an infinite amount of data for free. So you know, related to your point in trying to scope out what is the generalization and generalizability. So <laughs> these systems are good at closed worlds where the rules are, you know, ideally haven't changed in 2000 years and you can play yourself and you get as much data as you want. They don't generalize as much to the real world because you usually don't have the same kind of fixed set of rules and it actually is costly to get data. So, you know, if you're trying to figure out what I should do today with my life, you can't get infinite data and you can't solve, you know, I, I have, well, I'll give you an example of an article that I had somebody made. The article was with Ernie Davis in um, the ACM journal and the, illustrators came up with this great picture, which was um, 
we were talking about common sense reasoning and the importance of it. They had the picture of a robot on a tree cutting the limb from the wrong side, such that if it succeeded in the cut, the tree limb was going to fall down and so was the robot. And so that's an example of something you can't get by infinite self-play, right? You don't want to fall out <laughs> of a lot of trees. You want to have some other way of getting to that source of knowledge. Um, if you can work in a hermetically sealed problem where there's kind of no influence from the external world and it's always the same, then you can use this kind of brute force um, approximation. But if you have to deal with things you can't expect, it's problematic. Now, it's problematic for other approaches too. Nobody has a great AI solution to dealing with the unknown. So um, you might re remember when long-term capital failed, and was a billion dollar epic mess up, you know, a bunch of Nobel Prizes had a model of what they thought would work and they didn't realize that, you know, you could have problems with the, the Russian bond market that would influence <laughs> this other stuff, right? That wasn't a deep learning failure. That was a failure of models though. Yeah. And we don't know how to make models in general versatile enough to deal with the unknown. I mean, I was not a fan of Rumsfeld, but his point about unknown unknowns is, mm -hmm. is actually a good one. Um, human beings are better at dealing with unknown unknowns, um, at least in some cases, than any technology that, we, that we've currently developed. So like, if, if you imagine trying to make a domestic robot right now, I mean, Amazon's got something that they're talking about shipping. There's just a lot of stuff that comes up that nobody's anticipated. And if all you're doing is kind of looking stuff up in a database of what you've seen before, at some point that breaks down. So to your point about generalization, you know, nothing really unforeseen happens in Go if you've played yourself 20 million times. But in the real world, you know, it's snowing in Vancouver and that's not really happening. And I need to cross the street and I can't even see the street. And now what do I do? Right. And, you know, systems aren't really built around that. Well, we can see that there is th there's going to be some trade off um, between letting the algorithm learn by itself versus giving it some structure, right? Like you mentioned for the protein folding, where it's not just consider every configuration in space. There's some pre-existing uh, ideas that are built in there. My impression is that for chess and go, the lesson was don't spoil the algorithm by teaching it human tricks because it'll learn faster just by playing against itself. Yeah, I mean, that's true at this moment in the history of AI. I don't know that it's always true. So another weakness in current AI is we just don't know how to leverage existing knowledge. Hmm. We don't know how to specify it and we don't know how to use it. There are some domains where it's actually fine. So we can do like taxonomy. So if I tell you that um, a penguin is a bird, you can make a bunch of inferences about that and realize that it's going to breathe and reproduce. And, and, you know, so there's some things where, where we can take a bit of knowledge and extend it further. But we don't know how, I mean, first of all, in the case of Go, we don't of, often don't know how to represent the expert knowledge. In some cases we do, and we don't really know how to use it. And mm. it turns out in that domain right now, as you say, but with emphasis on the right now, mm -hmm. it is easier just to do brute force and just start over basically than to have a bunch of expert Go players tell you stuff. Although, you know, the ex there was actually an expert Go player on the off, was an author on one of these papers and probably <laughs> did say some things. And there, you know, there are some things that are built in because we know how to do them. Like we know that it's rotation invariant. Again, as a physicist, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. I, I can rotate the board, I can flip the board, and basically I, I wind up in, in the... The, the same conceptual space. Um, so there are some things we know how to build in. But, you know, here's another example. A, a general intelligence ought to be able to read Wikipedia and use all that information in order to make all kinds of decisions, like to help us with material science or medicine or whatever. And we don't have systems that can do that, that can sort of like take the results of hard-won human knowledge or it could be about you know almost any domain, um, and put them in. So right now the systems, right now the systems that we have are mostly kind of blank slates. They get whatever they know by having all of those nodes line up and 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 balance out in in the right kinds of ways, um, without any or without much influence from the knowledge of the world. And it's cool when it works. And in some domains, it works well, in others, it doesn't. But like, here's another case, driving. You would like to be able to just put in the rules of the California driver's code. 
and stick it in with your deep learning system. But we don't know how to do that. We yeah. just don't. <laughs> well, language is a great example, and I, you know, you've alluded to it several times already. Uh, uh, GPT three is the uh, system that everyone talks about these days. Um, I mean, maybe you could tell us just what how GPT three works. What's so interesting about it? To me, to be honest, I'm less impressed with its results than than many people seem to be. Well, I, I may be even less impressed than you are, but many <laughs> people are. It's true. In fact, most. Um, to me, it's a kind of parlor trick that's actually a mistake in, in the evolution of AI. Um, what it does is another, it is another of these systems, more complex than the one that we talked about before, but it's still basically about setting weights for connections. It has some prior structure around attention to help it know about relations between words over um, certain space and time. There are things called positional encodings. And, um, and we don't have to go into all the technical details, but the, the basic uh, framework, if you will, or, or the, is you get a prompt, it sees some set of words, and then it predicts what might follow. And in this way, it's kind of like the mother of autocomplete. Um, so you can type in anything, and it will continue in that same style. In some ways, it's astonishing. So, you know, you type in something that looks like a movie script, and it'll like continue you know, often with the same characters and the same format and, and, and all, um, all of this. Um, as a kind of surrealist generator, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. You type in part of a story and it will continue the story. Um, so why am I not enamored of it when it's capable of doing some really cool things? Like, I would not dispute that it can do really cool things. Um, oh, and I also, like, it's capable of being really grammatical, which earlier systems mm. were not. Right. Um, and it's kind of astonishing in how it does that. Nonetheless, I think that it's misguided. Um, and I think it's misguided because there's no real semantics there. No, there's no underlying understanding of what it is talking about. And <clears throat> this manifests in different ways. So um, it will give you fluent speech. I wrote an article that was supposed to be called GPT-3 Bullshit Artist. The... the um, the editor wouldn't let me call it that, so I think it's called <laughs> GPT-3 Bloviator. Um, okay, but they did allow us good. to have our uh, conclusion, which is that it's a fluent spouter of bullshit. Um, and we had examples like this. You're thirsty. You have some grape juice, but not enough. So you look around. You find some cranberry juice. You sniff it. You pour it into your glass, and then you – and GPT – auto-completes. And so it says, then you drink it, which is plausible, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. as a continuation. And then it says, you die. <laughs> and, you know, most people don't die by having cran grape juice. You know, it's usually pretty harmless stuff. So <laughs> this system doesn't actually understand anything about toxicology or you know, why right. you might die. It's just, statistically speaking, the probability of the word die after you sniffed and you're thirsty yeah. and some corpus that it is, you know, learned from happens to be high. And I think that illustrates what's really going on there is it's just looking for corpus through the corpus for correlations. It doesn't understand what those correlations are about. And that leads it to a weird position in terms of what it does. So you can't type in an idea and have it formulate that idea in words, which is what classic computational linguistics tries to do. It can only do this game. And then people work around this game of I'll feed my thing in and hope that it continues. And what they wind up, for example, with is a lot of toxic speech and DeepMind just had like, you know, 10 people working on the problem <laughs> and actually there are hundreds in the field trying to make these things not be as toxic. And yeah. there's no solution there because you just have the correlations. You don't have an underlying system where you can like query it the way you could query a database. So you could query a database and say, you know, how many people of this age group are here or whatever. You can't query GPT and say, are you making a toxic remark or are you you know, singling out a group. It doesn't know. It's just <laughs> statistical correlations between words. And so people are trying to put all these band-aids on top of it to make it less toxic, but it, it's not going to happen. The technology does not really afford that. And then it has a truthiness problem. So it's very fluent. And so it's easy for it to make stuff up and you not notice. And so, you know, it, it, it will make up whatever, you know, anti-vaccine stuff, if that happens yeah. to be in the database. It has no idea what, what it is that it's spouting. And, well, and I, I use an again, analogy. Again, no band aid that will solve it. Sorry. You had an analogy which I thought was very illuminating with the guy who won a Scrabble tournament in French, even though he spoke no French, because he just sort of memorized a list of French words that would be really useful in Scrabble. 
<laughs> yeah, I went back to that book by Fatsis to, to try to find, I think the, those people called them word tools or something like that. Like mm. they don't know what the words are, so they're just using word tools. And that's exactly what's going that's on. That's why I don't even like playing Scrabble against other people, because if they're good, then they've memorized all these little words that, you know, fit very Two well. Two-letter words, man. That's where it's at. Ah, terrible. But uh, I mean, uh, the thing that got me, I, I was actually, before I understood what it really was about, and I had seen some of the hype about GPT-3, I thought maybe it'd be fun to do a podcast where I interviewed GPT-3 and had it, you know, uh, voice synthesized. But then I realized the very basic fact that it has no memory. So it doesn't remember what you just talked about one question before. And so there's really just no, after five minutes, yeah. it becomes highly unamusing. <laughs> I'm doing an art project around that notion. And, you know, I did some interviewing of GPT and I would ask questions like, are you a computer? And it would say, yes. And mm -hmm. it would say, are you a person? It would say, yes. Like, the very I next know. sentence, like it doesn't remember. <laughs> so why not? Why why can't you just add some memory in there? Is it you know, what is the conceptual leap that makes it hard, or is it just that? There's, that's a it's, really good question. It's the, the, yeah. the, the, that's an A question there, um, for sure. The, the what is it about the nature of the system that makes it non-trivial to just add right. memory? And some people have tried. Um, certain kinds of things. It's just built from the foundation in a different way. It's built from the foundation to correlate little bits of information, like the probabilities of these words following those words. And it's not built to have a representational scheme. It does not contact a representational scheme about these are the entities in the world and yeah. these are their properties. It's just built like on a completely different path. And, you know, maybe there's some way of merging them. And I do think that ultimately the answer to AI is going to come from merging at least some of the insights from the GPT tradition with some of the insights from the more classical AI tradition. But I don't, I don't think it's going to come literally from merging GPT with these other systems because GPT does not have the internal representations that you need. Um, you know, it, it'd be like saying I've written this big computer program, but I'm not going to let anybody else see what's inside of it. And now I just want you to hum, and I hope that they match together. They're not, you know. <laughs> they, yeah, there needs to be some planning to make them. There needs to be uh, some planning around what are going to be what we call technically the interface conditions. Yes, yeah. um, and it doesn't have it doesn't have an API to use you know computer geek terms an API where you can um, say, hey, what are the people that you're talking about right now? What are the assertions that you've made about them? What are you presupposing? And you can't build the API because it isn't there. I mean, you it know, seems to me it like sometimes that's... looks like it's there because it looks like it's co coherent, but it's a superficial illusion of the fact that it's drawing on this vast database of things that people have said. You can't build the API to do it. It, it seems like this is a pretty strong argument just by itself for deep learning or that kind of statistical correlation to be a tool used by a symbolic manipulator. Like, you know, that you need some view of the world that is represented symbolically, but then by all means have some deep learning help you with what the correlations are to predict what's going to come next. Well, there's a narrow version of that and a broader version, I guess. The narrow version, I think, is actually wrong, and the broad version, I think, is right. So the broad version is yeah, we need to have symbol systems rely on learning systems to do some of their grounding about what those symbols are about. Um, and I think that's the broader argument that you're making. I think is yeah. just right. The narrower version, I don't think GPT itself is actually the right tool sure. for doing the grounding because it doesn't have those interface conditions. It hasn't been built from the ground to land in the right place. So like you're, you're trying to have two sides of the bridge or the tunnel, I mean, meet up. And it just wasn't built that way. Um, but I, I think the idea of building that t tunnel um, is right of like, let's figure out what these systems are good for. Like there are lots of opportunities in the world to be tracking correlations, but you need to have respect, I think, for where you're trying to wind up. And, and as a cultural matter, as a sociological matter, the deep learning people for about 45 years have been, or no, actually like 60 years, have been aligning themselves against the symbol manipulating tradition. <laughs> okay. Well, now, you know, this is why we're on the podcast. We're going to change, change that. <laughs> Sorry, say again? This is why we're having this podcast. We're going to we're gonna change it. You're doing your- Well, I was about to say, it might be changed a little bit. So Jeff Hinton, who's the best known person in deep learning, has been really, really hostile to symbols. It wasn't always the case. In, in the late 80s, he wrote a book about bringing them together. Um, and then he, at some point- 
went off like completely on the deep learning side. Now he goes around saying deep learning can do everything. And he like told the EU don't spend any money on symbols and stuff like that. But Jan LeCun, one of his disciples actually said in a Twitter reply to me yesterday, you know, you can have your symbols if I can have my gradients, okay. which actually sounds like, you know, yeah. compromise. Right. So I was, I was kind of excited to see that, that. That does sound good. Sometimes people can like say they're on opposite sides, but really be uh, pretty close to each other. Uh, there, there's one example I want to get on the table because uh, it was it really made me think, and I think it, this is the time to do it, which is the identity function. You talk about this in your in your paper. So let's imagine you have some numbers. Uh, they go through a process that spits out an output from the input, and every single time the output is just equal to the input. So you put in one zero zero one zero binary number, and it puts out the same number. And you make the point that every human being sees the training set, you know, here's five examples and goes, oh, it's just the identity function. I can do that and extrapolates perfectly well to what is meant. But computers don't or deep learning doesn't. Yeah, deep learning doesn't. I, I don't think it means that computers can't, but it means that what you need to learn in some cases is essentially an algebraic function or a computer program. Um, part of what humans do in the world, I think, is we essentially synthesize little computer programs in our heads. We don't necessarily think of it, but the identity function is a good example. I'm just, my function is I'm going to say the same thing as you, or, you know, we can play like Simon says, and then, you know, I, I'm going to add the word Simon says to the ones that go through and not the ones that don't go through. Very simple function that, you know, five-year-olds learn all the time. Um, and it's done as a function that applies to a whole bunch of different inputs. So you can say, yeah. Simon says, touch your finger to your nose, or Simon says, put your, your phone in front of your nose, or Simon says, put your wrist strap on your head or whatever. Um, your viewers can't see me doing these ridiculous things, but I'm <laughs> glad you're laughing. Um, and so you can do this on a, you know, infinite set of things. And that's really what functions are about and what right. programming is about doing these things with an infinite range. Um, identity. This is the same as that. You learn the notion of a pair in cards and you can do it with the twos and the threes and the fours. And now I make a new deck. I don't have twos and threes and fours. I have, I don't know, stars and guitars. And you can tell me that a pair of guitars means two guitars. You've taken that new function, put it in a new domain. That's what deep learning does not do well. Right. It does not go over to these new domains. There are some caveats around that, but in general, that's the weakness of this system. And people have finally realized that um, nowadays people talk about extrapolating beyond the training set. But that mm. the paper that you read, um, I don't know which version, but I first was writing about this in 1998, um, is really capturing that point. It took a long time for the field to realize that there are actually different kinds of generalization. It also goes back to the past tense stuff. So people said, there's no problem. Our systems generalize. And I said, no, there's these special cases. And finally, now they're saying, oh, there are these special cases when you have to go beyond the data that you've seen before. And really, that's the essence of everything where things are failing right now. So let's take driving. You know, these systems extrapolate or sorry, interpolate very well in known cases. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can, you know, change lanes in the environments they've seen. And then you get to Vancouver on this crazy snowy day that nobody predicted and you don't want your driverless car out here um, right. because you now have to extrapolate beyond the data and you really want to rely on like your cognitive understanding of where the road might be because you can't see the lane marker anymore. But um, I think that's that the kind of reason they can't do it. your identity Current function system. example. Uh, it, it raises a, an interesting philosophical question about what the right rule is, because it's not like the deep learning algorithms just made something up. But you, you gave an example where the training set all with a bunch of numbers that all ended in a zero and the other ones were, you know, random. And so we figured it out. But the deep learning just thought the rule was your output number always ends in a zero. And the thing is that that is a valid rule. You know, it didn't just completely make it up, but it's it's clearly not what a human would want the conclusion to be. So how do I've been talking about this for 30 years. I've made that point in my own papers. Be the first person to ever ask me about it. <laughs> well, um, how do we which, formalize which brings the joy idea? to my heart? It, it's, yeah. it's really a deep and interesting point, right? That um, it's not that even when these systems make an error, it, it's not that they're doing something mathematically you know, random Arbitrary, or something yeah. like that. They're, they're doing something systematic and lawful, but it's not the way that we see the universe. And in certain cases, it's not the sort of functional thing that you want to do. Um, and that's very hard for people to grasp. So for a long time, people used to talk about deep learning and rule systems. It's not part of the conversation now as much as it used to. But they would say, oh, well, the deep learning system learns the rule that's there. 
And what you as a physicist understand or what a philosopher would understand is that rules are underdetermined by data. You, yeah. you need something, you know, there are multiple rules. An e easy example is if I say two, four, six, eight, what comes next? You know, it, it could be 10, but it could be something else. <laughs> and, and you really want some more, more background there. So it turns out that deep learning is mostly driven by the output nodes, the, the sort of the, the nodes that are at the end giving the answer. And they each learn things independently of one another. And that leads to a particular style of computation that is good for interpolation and not so good at extrapolation. And people make a different bet. And I, I did these experiments with babies to show that even very young people make this different bet, which is we're looking <laughs> for tendencies that hold across a class of items. We're looking for the rule. That's just how we're built. Sometimes that gets us in trouble. There's, there's a word apophenia, which is like looking for patterns that aren't even really there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so sometimes it... it it doesn't serve us well, but it very often does. And language is a great example where it serves us really well. You learn a grammar and then you can apply it to any words that you can throw in that grammar, even novel words. So if I told you that this thing was called a blicket, then we can start talking about blickets right away. I can say, <laughs> how much did that blicket cost you? Would you sell me your blicket? Would yep. you recommend the blicket? Is there something, an alternative to the blicket? Like, you know, you're off to the races with one training example because you put it in the context of something that is rule governed, where you have a grammar that tells you not only the syntax, blicket, the plural, is, the morphology is going to be blickets and it's going to tell me how I can use it with verbs and nouns, but also semantics. You can know that I probably mean an individuatable object, a single object that I can go and count. And you know, all this kind of stuff like right away because you have a world model that you map your language onto. That's Good. what it's really about. Well, and, and this is exactly where I was going to go with this, because what is the way that clearly, you know, with, with all this setup, we need to give our world model to our computer friends, to our artificially intelligent friends. And how do we do that? Is it that we human beings need to formalize our sort of manifest image of the world, our, our picture of common sense, and then turn it into a bunch of symbols? Or is it, and I'm sure that I think I know what the answer to this is, could we deep learn our way into common sense? You know, could we just, is there a way of letting computers figure out the same kind of common sense that we have? I take a view that I think is a little like what Kant was trying to say in the critique of pure reason, although I'm never sure I've completely understood that <laughs> book. But um, you know, he talks about having basically prior knowledge yeah. of space and time. Um, and I'm sorry I haven't read your book, which would be super relevant at this point. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think, and so I, I like to hear your take on it, but my view is you can learn a lot, but that you need a framework to right. learn, to, to embed that knowledge. And so minimally, I think you need to know that there is space, that there is time, that there is causality, that there are enduring objects in the world and some other stuff, but like stuff like that. And I believe that there's some reasonable evidence from the animal literature and the human infant literature to think that these things are in humans innate. Um, I think you need to start with that or else you just wind up with GPT. Hmm. Um, and in fact, I think GPT is a brilliant experiment, unintentional, but brilliant um, on the idea of could you just learn everything like, let's say, from words or from, you know, people haven't really done it from pixels, but I think you'd wind up in the same place. And I think the answer is no, you, you don't wind up with the API I'm talking about if you don't have prior notions about enduring objects that you're talking about. Then you just you're just in correlation soup and yeah. it's, you know, made the best job of correlation soup that I've ever seen. But it's still correlation soup and it doesn't really connect to those things, which means that it can't know that it's ridiculous to say I'm a computer and a person in one breath or two breaths. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have the framework to know that like things don't tend to change too much over time because it doesn't know what time is. So I don't fully have an answer to the question that you posed a minute ago, but I think it starts by saying we're going to learn some stuff, but it's going to be rel relative to a framework where we have some basic knowledge about the world to start with, that there are these enduring objects, et cetera. I mean, just to emphasize how tricky all this is, you know, it, I think it maybe undersells the difficulty if we just think about there's space and there's time and there's objects and they have solidity because there's also, you know, number one, there are relationships between these objects. There are functions Absolutely. that they have. You already mentioned causality. You mentioned the fact that you, there are values. You don't chop up the sofa to put it away because that's something that is already away in some sense. And so it's going to be quite 
a trick. And and I guess what you're saying is, and I think I think I agree. You're saying that it, the computers are not just going to learn all that stuff by looking at correlations, but but there's a still a tremendous program out there in front of us of figuring out what it is we want them to know ahead of time. Yeah. So the the most impressive shot on goal, to use a kind of cliche I've heard a bunch lately, um, or in Canada. It, is, is uh, right. No, but I heard it a lot around the vaccines. Uh, and, you know, rightly, I think people said this is going to work. There's so many shots on goal. Um, and, and they did. Um, we underestimated the human capacity to ignore data, but that's another issue. Um, so um, Doug Lanett built this thing called Psych, which you may or may not know about. Um, CYC. Um, he's done it for the last 35 years. And it was an attempt to put all of common sense knowledge or a large fraction of common sense knowledge in machine interpretable form. And it hasn't been the home run that he thought it would be. And I think people have drawn the wrong lesson from his lack of a huge, obvious success. So like he didn't build Google with it. Right. Um, and you know, he may have hoped that he would have. Um, but I still think it, what he was trying to do was right. I think maybe it failed because it started too soon with a different set of tools than we would do to use the project that he was trying to do. But I think the project is right, that we're not going to solve this in AI problem um, or general intelligence problem without having a lot of knowledge in formats that the machine can leverage. So, you know, you need to know if you're predicting about grape juice and cranberry juice, that they're both juices and that other things being equal, you can mix juices together and you won't die or whatever. Um, and, there's a question about like what level of specificity you want all mm. of that stuff mm -hmm. to be in. Do you want to derive everything from like, you know, quantum mechanics? Do you want to have intermediate representations at the level of juice, which is what people do? Um, but you need some kind of knowledge that machines can reason over. And he built something like 1100 micro reasoners that, that reason over things like economics and I don't know if beverages are in there or not, but you know, <laughs> lo lots of little domains and, and desires. The most impressive thing he has, and I write about this in an article called The Next Decade in AI and give the reference to his article, which might be in Forbes or Fortune, so I can't remember which. Um, he goes through this example with Romeo and Juliet, where the system is actually able to reason about something complicated, like what Juliet thinks is going to happen when she drinks this potion that's going to fake her death. That's really sophisticated stuff. And he shows that his system that has this common sense knowledge can make good inferences around that. And nothing in the deep learning tradition can do anything like that. And it's a proof of, print, you know, conceptual proof, proof of concept that if you have the right knowledge, you can actually get machines to do really rich inference. But there's also an asterisk around it, which is like, it doesn't just read the, the Shakespeare and make this inference. Rather, he has converted the Shakespeare into a set of logical propositions, and then the system is able to reason over those logical propositions. Mm. And so I guess the skeptic would say, well, that's the whole, he's left out the whole problem. I'm a little <laughs> bit more optimistic. I think he has left out a huge problem, but also showed that another part yeah. would be solvable if, if we do one piece of it. Um, but it, it's a, there's a whole interesting set of issues that don't even get talked about that much, which is like, can we really do this without knowledge sort of like what he was doing? My answer would be no. We need something like what he was doing, but also that he did it in the 80s. And we know a lot about, for example, statistical representation of information that he didn't, he didn't have the tools um, to use then. So like you want a lot of distributional information. You don't want to just discretize things in, into logical bins. You also want to know like what's typical and. Um, he doesn't have a lot of that kind of stuff represented. So you, like, you do it differently if you did it now. But I think what he was trying to do is still of the essence. I'm reminded of several years ago, Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired at the time, wrote some little piece saying that theory is dead in science. My least favorite article of Chris Anderson's and of Wired's <laughs> of all time. And, uh, I mean, his, his logic was, look, if we have enough data, we can just figure out what all the correlations are. Who needs a theory? And I wrote one of the responses uh, and I said, look. Tycho, Tycho, I should say, Brahe, the famous astronomer, collected a lot of data. And uh, people like Kepler, his his uh, protege, uh, found some correlations in the data and constructed some very useful rules. And that was good. But it was when Isaac Newton came along and invented a theory to explain why Kepler's rules were there. That was when we really understood something, because then we could mm -hmm. talk about 
beyond, you know, going extrapolating beyond the data sets, et cetera. So in some sense, maybe the the worry about or the problem with deep learning is that we're too good these days at being Tico and Kepler because we're able to manipulate these huge data sets. But true understanding won't come until we are able to abstract uh, a simple set of rules, which will be a little bit more robust than the original data sets. Well, I mean, I think even getting to Kepler would be progress and that most of the work in the sort of AI scientific discovery stuff builds in the answer in some way or another. And like, you know, what Kepler did that was awesome was was to kind of come up with his own answer. He wasn't like, you know, choosing from three templates or something like that. Like there's a really cool paper by Josh Tenenbaum and um, Charles Kemp where they see data and they infer like, does this follow a ladder or a circle or whatever, these kind of conceptual relationships, but all the choices are built in in the beginning. Yeah. And what, and like, it's still a cool paper, but the, the really cool paper, which nobody knows how to write, I don't know, you know, either would, would actually induce that these are even the, the logical forms that you should think about. And that's, you know, maybe that's closer to, to what Newton did, but I, I would give Kepler some cred for that too. You know, there's a problem. Some people sometimes talk about, about, extracting like what the variables are that you even want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often the the critical thing where sometimes, you know, there's a billion different choices and you need to know this is the one that, that I care about. Um, it's actually impressive even that children ever learn what integers are, for example. <laughs> this is the kind of thing yeah. that, you know, if I were still a professor, I retired as a professor young, but it, um um, if I were still a professor, I would be telling everybody, work on this problem. How is it that, um, and Susan Carey is actually telling people this, how is it the kids actually figure out what integers are, right? That's an example of a kind of conceptual apparatus that's incredibly valuable. And yet, you know, it's not obvious that it's innate. Like, it's pretty obvious that number is innate. So, you know, so mm. many animals have some conception of approximate number, mm -hmm. you know, that 12 is more than seven, like any animal can, most animals can figure that out. Um, but knowing what a discrete countable system is where you can have infinity, you know, that's a pretty cool intellectual accomplishment and kids do it. They do the same thing when they learn to read. Some kids don't, but most of them do. Um, a harder example is fractions, you know, the median split on SAT is apparent, SAT math is apparently, do you really get what fractions are or not? Mm. Um, do other primates understand form integers? Of this, say again. Do other primates understand integers? You can get them to count. You know the extent to which they understand integers is not totally agreed on. Okay. Um, I don't you know. know There's yeah. some controversy in the literature. They can at least do things like remember a sequence of small integers. Um, you know whether they get to the point of realizing, hey, I could just keep going with this forever <laughs> if you just teach me the right words for it. I don't know. Well, um, it, it, it goes right into what I wanted to ask next, which is the extent to which being inspired by biology and evolution and, and actual human reasoning is useful, right? Like evolution uh, is not goal-directed. It was not set up to try to build a perfect computer. And the human brain is really good at driving and talking and, and not so good at playing chess or multiplying big numbers together. Uh, do you think that we can take how evolution got us to where we are as as inspiration for this program of of hybrid I think the right systems. word is inspiration, right? So yeah. you know, there's this field of biomimicry, and I think that the the moral of that story is there's often useful stuff, and then there's stuff you don't want to copy. So like, you don't want to build your theory about how to support objects around the human spine is a terrible solution to supporting, <laughs> you know, this heavy thing right. on the top of the stock. And that happens to be there because we were quadrupeds and it was kind of evolutionarily cheap in the sense of being likely um, to rotate the quadruped, you know, 90 degrees and then, then you're vertical and you're biped and it's great, but really like a tripod would have been a whole lot better. And so like, you don't, you don't want to copy everything about our design. In fact, I wrote a book called Kluge, which was about all the things I think are lousy about human cognition. Yeah. Starting with, you know, or, or focusing on things like confirmation bias, where we notice evidence for our own theories. And, you know, our political system right now is a 
epic morality tale in, in confirmation bias and how bad that is. So you don't want your AI system to be subject to confirmation bias where it comes up with theories, notices evidence for those theories, pats itself on the back and ignores the counter theories. Like the last thing in the world you would want an AI system to do. Um, so we don't want to copy biology, but we do want to learn from it. So we want, you know, there are things that people still do way better than machines, even though there are things we do really poorly. Um, so we wouldn't want to copy the memory systems of people because they're not that great. Yeah. But on the other hand, they're cue driven in a way that's kind of cool. And maybe we can kind of do that in AI now. Um, but the way that people can understand <coughs> a semantics in relation to a syntax, that's really interesting. We don't know how to do that with machines. Maybe we'll figure out a better way to do it than people do. But right now, the only game in town is people. So let's, you know, see if we can learn from them. Can you so, explain that 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 issue uh, without uh, we're defining the word semantics and syntax as you're using them? I mean, that issue is how do you relate the meanings of words to the ways in which you assemble them and derive the meaning of a sentence in terms of its parts? Yeah. And, you know, it turns out that GPT can actually replicate the assembly of the parts into a grammatical sentence, but it can't relate that to a situation in the world that is being described by its sentence. Hmm. It, it, and it certainly can't go, you know, back. It can't actually go in either direction. You can't give it a situation in entities and expect a sentence that will validly describe them, um, nor go the other way and get the sentence and, and figure out. Whereas you and I, that, that's what we're doing, sometimes imperfectly, but we're we're trying to grasp each other's meaning. So you're you're building a model. What is Gary is actually saying there, right? And you know we have a limited bandwidth and, and whatever, but you know we get there. And the machines don't really have that capability right now in a general way. I guess um, I'm just wondering how much uh, you went back to Kant a little while ago, but how much innate knowledge in the human brain is crucial to this kind of reasoning that we do in extrapolating. And is that something that would help us figure out what to build in to a good hybrid AI system? I mean, first thing I'll say is it's controversial. No, mm -hmm. Nobody knows. I spent you know, the first two thirds of my career as a developmental psychologist slash cognitive psychologist thinking very deeply about this. I wrote a book called The Birth of the Mind, which was about how you might get innate structure given the tools of developmental neuro or molecular biology and what we know about uh, developmental neuroscience and so forth. And, you know, so I thought about these things a lot. And the honest answer is we don't know exactly what's innate. The best work, I think, is done by Elizabeth Spelke, a developmental psychologist mm -hmm. at Harvard. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a, a, a lot of work out there. Um, my best guess is that we have at least about a dozen things that are innate, and there could be a lot more. So um, a dozen things include things like the ability to represent these abstractions that we were talking about, the ability to distinguish between types and tokens. So like know that this water bottle as opposed to water bottles in general, space, yeah. time, causality, all, all those kinds of things are like form a bare minimum. And I've written about the, this occasionally. Um, and then you could have a lot more. I often point to the last chapter of Pinker's uh, first popular book, The Language Instinct, where he runs off a list of like 15 things that includes like, I think I'm quoting verbatim, a mental Rolodex. And maybe that is innate. Um, you know, some things you might be able to derive if you had others. Like if you had a cost benefit system, which I think is innate, and you had abstract variables and you had a few other things, maybe you could acquire some of the others. And then there's a tension in the developmental psychology literature, or an, I'll actually, call, I won't just call it a tension, a mistake, a foundational <laughs> mistake, which, which is that people think that if something could be learned, it is not innate. But that's wrong, right? So mm. think there may be many things that could be learned, but maybe biology has chosen, so to speak, and you know mm -hmm. all the ways in which I'm being anthropomorphic, but sure. has you know alighted upon solutions that make those innate because it's a whole lot safer or faster or whatever. So you think about a, a baby Ibex scrambling down a mountain. It is not working out online the physics of <laughs> objects and, and slopes and stuff like that. That is there in that baby. Or, or a, a honeybee can calculate the solar azimuth function and extend it to lighting that it's never seen before. Um, if you do the the right experiment, so there's clearly innate stuff there ab about physics and observation and yeah. and so forth. So there may be a lot more than just the ten or so things that I'm talking about, 
But even those 10 have made me kind of like public enemy number one in the machine learning <laughs> world where where they want to learn everything from scratch. And they're like, why is Gary always on about this and Nate and this stuff? How, you know, how do you know? Whatever. Um, I think that the one of the biggest problems with the field of AI is that right now it is dominated by um, a group of people who do machine learning. And there's the old saying of to a man who has a hammer, everything is a nail. And so the people in machine learning have made astonishing progress in some ways in the, the last decade. Mm -hmm. And so they think that the tool that they have is the tool. Right. Whereas I think the right thing is say, congratulations, that is an awesome tool. We thank you for it. Now let's see how we could use it in combination with other tools to do even more awesome things. But it's been a bitter battle getting people to even think about that. Well, one of the possible ways of thinking about this is, yeah, I, I kind of don't want to think of Alpha Go or whatever as intelligence almost at all. Like it's a, it's a very good at playing Go, uh, but it doesn't remind me of a human being in in very many well, other it's ways. It's like an idiot savant. I mean, I I, I would say that intelligence is multi dimensional. Yeah, and some of the things that I think are fairly counted as intelligence are like doing that kind of computation and it's, it's fine to call it as long as you realize that it is multi-dimensional and there are other dimensions where you know it's not even showing up to bat so you know one definition of intelligence is like adaptively solving unknown problems and it doesn't have that at all yeah well and is is the general goal of trying to make ai equal the capacities of human intelligence the right goal or should we just be oh, we saying... shouldn't do equal we should go for exceed <laughs> dan, dan okay. kahneman and i had this conversation we sort of came up with this phrase together in a way it was at a panel or whatever which is humans are a low bar i think that was his oh, all right. and i said <laughs> in and yet we still can't exceed it yet right we, we you know we we surely should want our machines not to be human level intelligence but to be way smarter than us so you know we we want if we're going to trust AI as much as we seem to want to, um, it's got to be good, right? You know, if we're going to put it <laughs> in charge of stuff, whatever yeah. that stuff is, um, you know, it better be able to not be subject to confirmation bias. It better not just perpetuate, you know, racist stereotypes from the past, but actually be able to put values so that it's not just interpolating, but extrapolating to the you know, world that we want to have. Right. And that means it's going to be better than most people or better than all people. You know, that should be what we're aspiring to. Um, what we're settling for now is we've got these cool tools and they can do some stuff. And sometimes they actually, you know, tell people to commit suicide or say racist things or whatever. And we're like, but, you know, but I get really good recommendations from Amazon. So it's OK. <laughs> and like, that's where we are now. It's I'm not super thrilled with that. But you know, but. but I guess what I'm getting at is, I mean, as you, as you said, I completely agree that there's very many different kinds of intelligence and uh, computers are going to be, it's going to be easier to make computers good at some kinds of intelligence than it is at other kinds of, of human intelligence. And w I'm, I'm sure both are important, but, you know, how do we balance just putting computers to work at the things they're good at versus trying to nudge them to become good at other things that we human beings know and love? I think it starts with what you just said. I often make the, your point a slightly different way, which is that um, people talk about artificial intelligence as if it was one thing, hmm. but it's actually many things. It's actually a whole family of algorithms and also databases and, and, um, and so forth that have different properties. They're good at some things. They're not good at other things. That's going to change over time. So there's the AI of 2022 is different from the AI of 2019. And I sure as hell hope that the AI of 2025 <laughs> is better than what we've got right now because it's problematic now. Um, and you can't just talk about it like it's a magic wand. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a set of tools that are more or less appropriate to certain problems. And so it's totally fine to use current AI for photo tagging. 2025 AI will be even better at it. But the cost of getting a mislabeled photograph is generally not that high, unless then again, you're using it for surveillance, yeah. in which case maybe it's really high. So, you know, I just saw another one of these examples of somebody who like went to jail because an AI system misread something. There was, I think in the, in the book, we gave an example of a, something in China that, that 
gave somebody a speeding ticket because their face, they were an actress, their face was on a bus that went faster than, or what, <laughs> like, you know, and, and so the wrong person yeah. got, you know, convicted of, of the crime. You know, the, the, the tools are, are really appropriate and then not appropriate depending on, on how they get used. So you can tolerate the error in photo tagging if you're not using it to identify criminals. If you're identifying the criminals, then you probably need at least 2025 AI or whatever, you know, 2030 AI because it's the, the stakes are so high. Um, same thing with suicide prevention. Like you can write a little chat bot that'll make people feel better some of the time. But when the stakes are high, I don't think the tools we have right now are up to it. Um, driving is another example. It's easy to build a car that can follow a lane. You can have like 70 hours of training data and video show this and you can follow a lane and that's great, but it doesn't mean that you know what to do on a snowy day. Um, and so, you know, we have to be very careful about the laws around driverless cars. And, you know, like right now, I think Elon Musk is beta testing on public roads. I don't think that's cool. There've been some accidents. Um, and so, Understanding that AI is actually a heterogeneous thing mm -hmm. rather than a single magic wand is important. Now, that makes it hard, right, because people want a policy that's sort of about AI writ large, and that doesn't match the reality of we are incrementally developing science and engineering to make things better, and we understand some of it and not others. And, and without asking you any uh, to make predictions about timescales or anything like that, do you see any obstacles to AI being just as good at human beings as human beings are at, you know, writing poems or symphonies and so forth? In principle, no. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're not going to have the emotions, um, you know, that might drive some of that stuff. It's actually not that hard to write you know, knockoffs of, of Bach without the, yeah, um, already without the emotional resonance. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I mean, one piece of your question is about specifically about creativity. And then there's the larger question. So many particular things that we would define as creative, we can already build machines to do without that connection to the underlying emotional impulse that might lead to something. And so like vocals are hard because vocals are really about <laughs> emotion. Um, you know, synthesizing a drum beat, you know, Lo Logic 12 or whatever is the latest edition can do that pretty well, right? Yeah. You, you know, there's a humanized function to add a little random variation and make it sound like a person. You know, there, there are certain things that we can do, you know, very, very well. Um, and in some cases have been able to actually for 30 years and like people are reinventing them with deep learning, but people already knew how to how to do some of those things. Um, the, the larger question, um, well, sorry, one more thing. There are some artistic endeavors that I think are way beyond current computers, though, um, like a movie, right, mm -hmm. where you have to have coherence over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, GPT can actually make advertising jingles that are like two liners pretty well, but it can't keep the coherence that you would need for, you know, for an ordinary film. You could make something, you know, <laughs> something from the late 60s yeah. <laughs> with pharmaceuticals involved that seemed interesting. Um, but long form is not the strong point of what we have right now and, and won't be for a while. Um, but I don't think anything in the realm of cognition is impossible, right? You know, we are just meat yeah. computers and, 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 you know, we don't quite understand how those meat computers work. But there are information processors that, you know, take in information and manipulate it and come up with outputs. That's what our brains do. And, and computers, you know, get better at that. And I don't see any like principled argument that says 500 years from now, people will still be smarter than machines. I just don't see it. 500 years is much safer than 20 years. I think you, you've chosen wisely about your, your time horizon there. But I guess, um, you know, th there are people who are worried about existential risks from AI taking over and have different values than us. Um, are, do you share those worries? I mean, clearly giving AI's value systems at all, uh, recognizable to us, uh, is, is a tricky situation. So I wrote this piece in 2012 called Moral Machines for The New Yorker. Um, I was one of the first people to talk about trolley problems um, in, in AI. Um, where in my particular case, in the New Yorker article, it was a school bus is out of control. You're on a highway. You, you know, should you sacrifice yourself? A lot of people picked up on this later. Obama talked about. Um, 
I now have some regret around that. <laughs> um, it's all well, your fault. We've we've narrowed it down. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there were a couple of us who wrote about it around the same time, but I was one of the first. Um, but the thing is that the real challenge right now is much lower to the ground than that. And it's not often that you actually come up with the school bus. Um, but, you know, Asimov's basic laws, you know, don't do harm. Just think about that one. Like the the <clears throat> model that we have now is around images. I show you a bunch of images and you learn from those images to recognize another. It doesn't work. That model doesn't work for harm. Yeah. I can't show you a bunch of pictures of harm and really get you to grasp the concept of what harm is. We just don't know how to program what harm is. We don't know how to program really any human values into current technology. And it's actually related to stuff we've been talking about throughout the whole conversation, which is it's kind of an interface thing. We don't know how to specify these things in terms that learning systems would understand. And we can't really do it entirely with innate set of rules either. There has to be some learning. We have to give some examples. Um, there was a film called Chappie a few years ago mm -hmm. where a robot learned its values. And, you know, one of the lines in the film is, is the robot is trying to figure this stuff out all out. And he's been, the robot's been captured by a bad guy. And it's the robot's master has said, um, you can't kill people. And the bad guy is a bit disappointed to discover that the robot knows this <laughs> because the bad guy would actually yeah. like the robot to kill people. But the bad guy is clever and he works around and he says, yeah, you can't kill people, but it's okay to harm them. And the robot is sort of, you know, left okay. to, yeah. to, to construct its own, own ethical values based on the input that it's getting. And the reality is that we will get to a point where maybe that already have gotten to a point where it would be really nice to have AI systems with values. And we mm -hmm. have not gotten to the point where we know how to program that in. So, you know, one of the problems with GPT-3 is all the toxic language that it produces because it's like trained on like the worst of Reddit and stuff like yeah. that. And um, <laughs> we just don't have, like that already it would be nice to constrain these systems such that they would follow some set of values. And you can argue about what that set of values would be, but we, we don't know how to do it. You know, DeepMind just had like, 10 people, 20 people working on this problem and came up dry. Like they don't, nobody knows how to actually constrain these systems to values. Um, they don't have the APIs to plug into and, and you know, it, it's a problem. So then when you come to the existential stuff, you know, the, the, I'm not worried about it now. I'm not worried about in the short term robots taking over the world. They don't care about us. They have no motivation to do so. And they're at, frankly dumb right now. You know, the, the ability to win at Go doesn't doesn't count for anything. I mean, you, Go is actually a great example because Go is about territory, right? And yeah. they don't actually understand anything about territory in the real world. Getting better at Go has not made them any more desirous of human territory, nor taught them anything about you know that would be useful in an actual battle. Like, I'm not too worried about those kinds of things in the near term. In the near term, I'm worried about misapplication of the AI that we have now. Um, but, you know, in the hundred year time frame, mm. it could, it could be an issue. I think it's fine that we have a few people around thinking about these issues now, even maybe they never come to pass. Um, but it's, it's good to have some thought into it. It's not an urgent need. Anyway, you know, I'd like to end on an optimistic, an optimistic note. So maybe, you know, <laughs> What if everyone listened to you? What if what if you were <laughs> you were not the bad boy of AI and everyone said, you know what? More symbols, more variables, more hybrid approaches to to join up to our deep learning. Like, how would you see AI going in the next uh, few years? Well, so I, I wrote a piece um, for the Times where I argued for a CERN for AI. And if people really listened to me, that's what they would do, and I would get people to gather around a particular problem, um, in part because. Otherwise, if you have a large sum of money, then people just do their own thing and don't actually coordinate. Yep. Um, and the, the problem that I would coordinate them around is having an AI that could read and understand the medical literature. I think there would be okay. enormous value in that. You could also maybe think about doing the same thing around climate change, the read and understand material science and, and, and so forth. Like either of those would be fine in, in my, my view. Um, but have people coordinate around machine reading. And not, I'm not talking about like keyword matching, which we can do very well right now. But ha having a system read a scientific literature, come up with experiments based on 
um, you know, what it reads, come up with novel solutions and so forth. Like, I think that could change the world um, and it would certainly push AI forward. So, if, you know, if I were king for the day, that's what we would do. All right. Now uh, people know it. They can spread the word. Gary Marcus, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thanks. This is really fun.